All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, um, and uh, then we'll go ahead and get started. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this time that we can come here another day of Sunday school on your Lord's Day, an extra hour of learning where we can be equipped and grow and further uh, grow in our systematic understanding of the Bible and the different doctrines that there are so that we can have a better understanding of you so we can worship you all the more. So Lord, we pray that uh, this would be a profitable time for us and glorifying to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we're in chapter 6 of the Confession. Chapter 6. So if you could do me a favor, and if you have your hymnal, uh, go ahead and grab the hymnal in the back. You should see the Westminster Confession. Um, And then if you have, hopefully you have the uh, 1689 as well. We're in chapter 6. We're going to be looking at mainly paragraph 1 today. We've already looked a lot about it in substance already, but we're just going to kind of talk a little bit more about it. And uh, I want to bring out a little bit of things in there that uh, we see that's, you know, in parallel with Westminster and then things that the Baptists also added, some changes here. Now, I was hoping to have a slideshow, and that just wasn't working on my computer right now, so... Um, this is the best we're going to do for now, and hopefully next week I can get it all synced. But right now, um, there's so as we remember, um, there was mainly four documents that the Baptists used when they were uh, compiling their confession. Right. So we had uh, First London, which came in 1644. Right. Then you have Westminster 1646, and then Savoy. Upon years of reflection afterwards, they decided, the Baptists, let's come out with uh, a second London. And they edited that and came out with it in 1677. And it was adopted, as we know, into the General Assembly in 1689. So um, that's all the documents, including uh, the Bible, was there handy for them as they were compiling their confession. And what we see that they did is they really loved First London, really uh, enjoyed that. Now, there's really no doctrinal change. They're just elaborating more in Second London and using words that a lot of the Reformed have already used to better articulate uh, the stuff. So it's just as um, the the substance is all there. Nothing's changed. They just, uh, and and so what we see in Chapter 6 is we see a compiling of First London and Westminster, and so we're going to look, just kind of parallel those and, and talk a little bit about why maybe they did that. Um, and then we're going to just kind of think of some objections that we also see a lot of people read into some of these things. So first off, let's just read paragraph one. Remember, this is a chapter six. It's dealing with of the fall of man, of sin and the punishment thereof. That's the heading. Um, and so let's read paragraph one. So it says, although God created man upright and perfect... He gave him a righteous law, which had been unto life had he kept it and threatened death upon the breach thereof. Yet he did not long abide in this honor, Satan using the subtlety of the serpent to seduce Eve, and by her seducing Adam, who without any compulsion, did willfully transgress the law of their creation and the command given unto them in eating the forbidden fruit which God was pleased according to his wise and holy counsel to permit, having proposed to order it to his own glory. So there's a lot here that is helpful because when we think of our confession, we we understand it's building upon what has come before, right? So we can see certain doctrines in here that we've already elaborated on in great detail earlier on in the confession. And so let's just maybe think of some of those doctrines. What are some of the doctrines that you see just in this paragraph that kind of pop up that we've already kind of elaborated? Yeah, so yeah, so what paragraph do you, would that apply to, you think? Providence. Yeah, providence, right? How he governs and executes all things, yeah. And then also doctrine of God, right? Chapter 2. So we see that he's holy, he's righteous. Um, We see um, that he's orchestrating, ordaining all things for his glory, that he permits according to his holy counsel, right? So all those we've 
you know, it's come before, so we have a robust understanding now of God's providence and how he works. Even, remember, in, in the paragraph uh, 5, I mean, chapter 5, paragraph 1, um, it talked about even, uh, let's see here. Oh, paragraph 4, actually. It talked about that he even, his counsel extendeth even to the first fall and all under, other sinful actions. So here we see, in no surprise, we see elaborating here the fall, and now we see it, again, according to his holy counsel to permit it. Now, this is more than just bare permission, as we saw earlier in Providence, when we wrestled with the doctrine of uh, sin and uh, God here. Um, how, do we, how do we reconcile the two? And we, we concluded that God is not the author of sin or the approver of it, that man's responsible of it, but he allows it, but not by bare permission, right? Remember that language there? And that's to say that, you know, it's not like man just did something that was outside God's will, and he's like, yeah, I, I guess I'll allow it. No, th- he ordained everything. He, he's using even the sinfulness of man, who man is responsible for, and he's orchestrating ultimately for his glory. So here we see it. It's no surprise that this paragraph follows providence. So if you see the progression Right? We started with Doctrine of the Scripture, chapter 1. You know, what do we believe about the Bible? What is the Bible? All that. And then it flows into Doctrine of God. Who is God? What does the Bible talk about who God is? Right? And then from there, it just keeps flowing and building. Right? We see God's decree. We then see uh, from there God's providence. Or we see creation. Right? If he's going to make his decree uh, happen in time and space, he has to create. From there, as he creates... He has to govern his creation to bring about his plan, which is God's providence. And now we come, now that creation has happened, now that we understand his providence, we come to the fall. And so here we are in in Genesis uh, 3, basically. And in Genesis 2 and 3, we see a great deal um, about that is foundation to our faith, building blocks uh, of the Bible and to the faith. Keel says this, Genesis 1 to 3 forms an essential foundation for the gospel, especially because it reveals covenant works. The doctrine of the covenant works teaches us more about the person and work of Christ, and in doing so, bolsters our assurance of salvation. So this is a crucial chapter about the fall. It tells us about what God requires, what happened, and then what's required of Christ for him to come and be the greater Adam. Right? Be the, the true and greater Adam. So it helps us to understand the work of Christ. It helps us to understand why we're fallen and why God chooses to, uh, what is his plan in redeeming, why it's necessary. Now, if you're familiar with Reformed theology today in our paragraph, um, you'll see that what the substance that we're dealing with, we've already talked about this, is dealing with the covenant works. Now, you look here, and, and did you see the word anywhere? In paragraph one, no, right? It's not here. Now, it's neither. Uh, we, we have to wrestle with some of these things. Now, um, one of the things that I want to read. Let me just read. Um, I want to read. You have Westminster in front of you, right? So lo- just look at that. It says, "Our first parents," and then it skips down to being seduced by the subtlety temptations of Satan, sin. Right? So there's a whole paragraph that brings out, in the beginning, God made all things, very good, created man after his own image. You know, right? We see that. Um, that although God created man upright, perfect, all this, um, we see that that's not in Westminster. So where did that come from? Right? Well, Savoy says it this way, God having made a covenant of works and life, thereunto our first parents and their, all their posterity in them. They, and then it goes on to say being seduced. So if you remember, we have First London, right? First London reads this way. In the beginning, God made all things very good, created man after his own image, filled with all met perfection of nature and free from all sin. But long he aboded not in this honor, Satan using the subtlety of the serpent to seduce first Eve, then her, then her seducing Adam, who without any compulsion. So that's just part of the first paragraph of First London. Okay, so if you're reading our paragraph, you can kind of see where some of the pieces are starting to come together, right? So 
what happens here in the beginning is you have first London that came out, then you have Westminster that came out, then you have Savoy that came out later. And what does Savoy do? Savoy decides we're going to elaborate here and we're going to talk about the doctrine that this talks about, that this paragraph talks about. Notice what they added. God having made a covenant of work and life thereunto. Okay, that's Savoy. So they added the phrase and said, this is a covenant of works here. Westminster doesn't have it. The reason Westminster doesn't have it is because they elaborate it in seven. Okay? So just to show you in chapter seven, uh, they elaborate that idea of covenant of works there. Um, in uh, chapter two, paragraph seven, the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works. Okay? So in Westminster and Savoy, both indications of talking about this covenant, they call it a covenant of works. Savoy decides, let's call it ahead of time in chapter 6 when we're actually talking about it. Westminster describes it and then later on says this is what it is. It's the first covenant is a covenant of works. Where the Baptists actually take out the phrase here. Um, because remember, it's following from Savoy. So they decided we're not going to follow Savoy here in this way. Notice it says, um, and their posterity unto them, they being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan. So First London takes this out. So we have to wrestle with the question, why? Why did they take that out? Um, the substance there, right? Remember when we went through covenant theology and we talked about it. If we read this, we're like, oh, yeah. Definitely, covenant works. Okay. Um, now we went through it ahead of time, so you can understand the concept of what covenant theology is, have a have an understanding. So when we look at it, you can at least be able to identify and have a knowledge of how the covenants kind of work together. Okay. So textual history here uh, underscores that great carefulness was taken to the first to second London here. They're using these sources. Um, Westminster, as we said, doesn't mention until chapter 7, 2. Savoy mentions it right here in, um, in 6, 1. But the Baptists will not mention covenant works in either area. So we have to wrestle with why. Okay? So coming to this point, we have to wrestle, well, do the Baptists then reject the concept of covenant works? Is that why they took it out? And that's what some people would actually write and accuse the Baptists of saying that because it's not here, and Savoy and Westminster both articulate it within chapter 6 and 7, uh, they're not going, they reject it. And I would argue that those who say that um, actually don't have a robust understanding of what the confession is doing. Um, if, you, if you actually follow with the covenant, um, or, or the uh, writers of the, of the 1689, the signers of it, one of them in particular was called Nehemiah Cox. Nehemiah Cox has a book called The Discourse of the Covenants. And if you're familiar with, uh, I sh in the beginning I showed a book. It was uh, called uh, From Adam to Christ, right? And it was by Cox and Owen. Um, and so we have it in uh, Cox deer for a reason, and they make a change for a, uh, a slight reason here. And they go on later on in this paragraph to actually, art or in the confession, to articulate this um, and actually use the phrase covenant works. But notice here, um, we see that if we just follow and read some of the people who've, you know, theologians who wrote some of the, who signed some of these, um, who were Baptists and all that, we can see they're not rejecting this at all. But they're trying to articulate this in a reason. And the reason is because they're actually trying to allow the flow to happen uh, in a way that uh, builds upon itself, right? So... The reason they don't follow Savoy is because they feel like they would just be elaborating again and saying the same thing again. Um, and if you go to uh, paragraph 7, uh, basically uh, what, what they have here is they, they emphasize the concept again. Uh, they could have never attained the reward of life unless God condescends by way of covenant. Uh, and this is playing the role for the covenant of grace to come here. And so what we see is uh, covenant works is actually uh, used later on in the confession. So flip over to chapter 19. I want to show you this. 
There's a reason why they don't do it here in particular. We just have to wrestle with that reason, okay? So in chapter 19 and chapter 20, the language of covenant works is very clear and plain, right? So all you have to do is just keep reading, right? Uh, Just keep reading and allow the confession to explain itself. Uh, The covenant of works was basically being broken by sin. Um, And what we see here is the language uh, was edited out to draw the attention mainly to the covenant of grace. But in chapter 20, it's mentioned um, where it talks about the law of God, right? This is a more robust understanding of, well, why why talk about it here in chapter 6 when we can talk about it when we elaborate on the law of God? Um, So in chapter 19, um, we see upon this here uh, the emphasis of the law of God, right? We see Mount Sinai was written on the hearts. We see the two tablets. Um, We see in paragraph one, not eating of the fruit. So all this is kind of substance about law, the do this and live. Um, It's commonly called the moral law, paragraph three. He then gave him judicial laws, and it just keeps on building, right? We then get to, uh, as you keep finding this in the confession, you then get to chapter 20, And uh, in chapter 20, we continue to see the gospel extent thereof. Um, And so you can see here, uh, they're admitting the language uh, where we would expect at first, but what they're trying to do is where the concept is there, you don't need the actual word to be there. So what we're seeing here is they're trying to emphasize here in chapter uh, 19 and 20 more of that language. Let me see where it is and what paragraph. Paragraph six, yeah. Um, Let me see where to start reading. So as it emphasizes grace and the third use of the law in chapter 19, true believers are not under the law as a covenant of works to be thereby justified and condemned, right? It's not only do this and live, right? You, you You don't look at the law and say, uh, do this and live. Uh, here's how you're going to be justified. You know, just work for it. Just do better, try harder. Um, so for believers, the law isn't the way of here's how you merit your standing and justification before God. Instead, the law is here to show you your sin, but also as that rule of life. Notice it says uh, it has a use, the rule of life, informing them of God's will, directs, binds them to walk accordingly, discovery of sinful pollutions in their nature, so, so again, we see the purpose of the law. It's not as a covenant of works, right? You continue on, and it says, though as, as due to them by the law as a covenant of works. So for those who uh, reject God, or for those who maybe don't know Christ yet, it is a covenant of works to do this and live. Um, so it continues, it is likewise to use the regenerate to restrain their compulsion. So again, we have the second... Uh, first use of the law, it restrains, um, it convicts, it builds affections, and all these things. The blessings may expect upon the performance thereof. So, right, to do this and live, there's still blessings upon obeying God's law. It's not for justification, but there's good that comes from obeying God's law. Uh, therefore, it's not due to them as a law, as a covenant of works. So man's doing good and refraining from evil, for the law encourages to the one and and differeth in the other is no evidence of being under the law and not of grace. So they want to extend it and mention law, covenant works, when they deal with actual law of God. So it's all building to that sense. But just because the word isn't there doesn't mean they reject the concepts. In fact, just go read the, the, read the authors of the confession and read what they're saying in their own theology and uh, go ahead and let that kind of inform you as well. So as we look at that, we see chapter 6 is trying to, rather than focusing on those things, it's trying to focus specifically on the nature of the fall and the violation of law. Okay? The focus is more narrowly defined. Let's just focus on how, what brought the fall in the first place. right? Because the chapter is of the fall. It's not of the covenant of works. So they're trying to say, let's just focus on that, and then when we deal with actual law, then we'll talk about covenant works. Um, the pattern is fit specifically with other changes we actually see them make as we continue through this paragraph. Um, And like we said, they don't reject it because we see it in chapter 19. 
and 20. Um, so in chapter 6 and 7, the language of covenant works is edited out to make our attention move towards the covenant of grace. Um, the idea is they want to focus on, on one over the other. Um, so it's not that they reject it. They definitely hold to it. It's just, and the substance of it is definitely all here in chapter 6, as we'll see. But uh, we just have to wrestle with that fact. Why, why is it there? And it just requires diligence and study and looking and further reading and allow them to kind of explain it. Um, I've heard it all different things. Oh, they reject the covenant works. They don't hold to you know, the, the federal headship of Christ because of that. And, and that's just not really understanding where this confession is coming from. So let's just kind of piece this together just so we can see how they adapted these things. This would be really nice to have a PowerPoint. Maybe I'll email you this paragraph. But in chapter 1, as we notice, uh, Westminster has of our first parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptation. And as you look at um, first Lon- or second London here, they do talk about using the subtlety of the serpent to seduce Eve. So it's slightly a little bit different um, wording because the wording that they're following here is their preferred wording from First London. They're just following that. Um, it's the same concept. They're just choosing to use their, uh, their, paragra- their paragraph there. Um, again, they have the emphasis here on federal headship. Um, although God created man upright and perfect, he gave them the righteous law. Um, so it's kind of re-articulating. What did God require? What was the standard? Uh, Savoy just says, let's just call that a covenant of works. Let's not explain that. So they basically just say covenant of works. There is life promised and death there. Um, they go on and say in Savoy, they did willfully transgress the law of creation and break the covenant in eating the forbidden fruit. Where later on in, in Westminster, I mean in 1689, it says they did willfully transgress the law of their creation and the command given unto them in eating the forbidden fruit. So they took out that idea of, of, of covenant there and, and focused on the positive law there of the command of the fruit. Um, they then follow with Westminster. God was pleased according to his wise and holy counsel to permit having ordered it and to his own to his own glory. Uh, Savoy doesn't have that. Um, So we can see they just use pieces to collaborate one much bigger paragraph here than Savoy and um, Westminster do. They do the same thing in similar paragraphs, and hopefully I'll get the the header uh, so we can look at that. But let's just kind of look at this paragraph in detail and kind of flush it out a little bit more, understanding the doctrine and seeing this through the scriptures. But that's just kind of the reasons why we see some of the differences here. Any questions just before we look at the, started to look at the doctrine here? If that wasn't clear, hopefully when I get the heading, uh, the, the PowerPoint of it, hopefully it'll be more clear. Kevin? Yeah. Yeah, it's be, it's because there's people who will accuse and say, okay, see, they're not mentioning covenant works here. Um, they reject it, and so I'm trying to just overcome and say, let's just keep reading. And you're right; they all address it in a certain, you know, in their fashion. So let's just keep reading, give the benefit of the doubt. They all have pretty much the same kind of doctrine there, just stated slightly differently. And so yeah, we just need to keep reading, really. And let's not get hung up just because there's a word missing. And I think we understand that because we're used to seeing concepts. We're used to understanding, okay, we can deduce from the text the substance of something without having to have the word. But there are, you know, biblicists and different kind of things who will read these things and just say, oh, the word's not there, so they reject it. So just kind of letting you know, hey, it is there. It's in chapter 19, 20. Just, you know, keep reading. So if you do hear that, um, it's not correct. So, 
probably spent too much time on that, but yeah, you're right. It, it does elaborate. Um, they all pretty much are addressing the same understanding there. Um, good. Um, so let's, let's just look at this. Um, what we see here is there's a historical act here, right? Um, we understand why. So we're talking about the need of salvation. Why do we need the covenant of grace to come in the first place, right? And it's because uh, there was the fall. We need someone before God says, do this and live. God gave the law. And there was a representative who was sinless who could come in our place and represent us. And God saw fit to do it that way. Ultimately, it was pointing us forward to what Christ would do. But he gave Adam the command, don't eat of the fruit. As we know, he disobeyed. And that brings us in. So, so paragraph one is all about first, here's, here's the context. right? Uh, Although God created man upright and perfect, he gave him a righteous law which had been unto life had he kept it and threatened death upon the breach thereof. So remember when we're understanding, you know, what is a covenant? Well, a covenant is an agreement with uh, legal sanctions, consequent blessings, and, and, um, and uh, threatens of the curses upon disobedience. So the curse was obviously death upon doing that, he, life upon keeping it. And... He said he did not long abide in his honor. Now, it doesn't elaborate exactly as you read Genesis 2 and 3. How long was this probationary period? Um, it doesn't talk about it. But the Baptist is saying here, it wasn't very long that he, caught, he was going to fall. Uh, some people think, you know, he didn't even last till uh, after, after day six when he created and God rested on the seventh. Um, Adam was already falling. Uh, we don't know. Obviously... Um, it's not, it, it's not you know, for sure laid out in scripture about the length of the probationary period, but it gets at the hint that it probably wasn't that long to happen. Maybe, you know, I'd say you know, within the day to maybe a week max probably, but that's just speculation. So uh, nothing to you know, die on a hill about, but they're saying it didn't last very long. Um, Satan used the subtlety of the serpent to seduce Eve and then by her seducing Adam, who without any compulsion did willfully transgress the law of their creation and the command to give them, to give an unto them in eating the forbidden fruit. So notice there's two things that this, the confession brings out that they transgress. Notice it says the law of their creation and the command given unto them in eating the forbidden fruit. Okay, so... The command given unto creation. What, what, what would we talk about that? What, what is that in, in particular? In particularly? So by virtue of being a creature, what, is that, what does that obligate you to be? Being in the image of God, what does that imply? Yeah, we're to image him. We're to reflect his holiness. Um, and that means that, you know, the Ten Commandments didn't come just, you know, at Sinai. They were, they were there written on the heart because we were called to reflect God. They knew how to love, that they were called to love God. They knew those things. Um, they knew it was wrong to murder, kill, steal, those kind of things. It wasn't like they ate the fruit and like, oh my goodness, now we know these things. Um, they had it in their heart and, and implied that because they were made in the image of God, they were to reflect those things. So the law of his creation, let's look at Genesis 2 here. Genesis 2, 16. And we see there's the law of their creation. It's the, their commission, right? First off, in 16... Um, uh, what we see here is the Lord commanded man, saying, Surely you may not eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Not only that, look in the first verse. I mean, the verse right before that, 15. The Lord God took man, put him in the garden to work and keep it. So part of the law of creation, part of his original task was to work and keep the garden. 
Okay, that didn't mean that you know he's he's merely to till, till it, right? The t the garden was the dwelling place of God. So basically, what this is commissioned to is is Adam is commissioned to maintain. You know, he's not just pulling out weeds; he's to maintain God's dwelling place. And if you think about it, who else was called to maintain the dwelling place of the Lord? Well, it was priests, the Levites. They were called to guard. They were called to keep it. They were called to protect it. They were called to keep it holy. Um, and so this here is almost like priestly language for Adam. He's saying, you are the priest in God's dwelling place, the garden in which he dwells, in which he meets with God as well. Uh, he is called to work and keep it. And I would argue that that means that he's actually to guard it. So if this, when the serpent came, uh, Adam was already failing. It's not like when Eve hit him, uh, gave him the fruit, that all of a sudden he was already he was failed there. He was already starting to not fulfill his commission, um, and so he was called to guard and protect it. Um, he was also car called to uh, show dominion. Right? We know he was called to be fruitful, and multiply. He was called to subdue. He was called to expand. All these things, and and as we the temptation comes, he's not really fulfilling those cultural. Uh, creational mandates that he's called to do. Instead, he's sitting there as Eve is being seduced. He's not guarding it. And it doesn't say like he was just far off. It was right there next to her. And he didn't speak up. He didn't do anything. And so he's not really guarding. He's not protecting. He's not loving his wife as much in that sense. And so what we see here is he's transgressing the law of his creation. He's not honoring God. He's not loving God. He's not loving his neighbor who is his wife um, in this way. Um, and so in so doing, he's transgressing that law, but also the command given unto them, which is specifically in eating the forbidden fruit. So this is called, remember we talked about, uh, so the command of the creation, I would argue, is the moral law of God, which is also given in, seen in the tasks specifically given to Adam to guard to keep the garden, Right? If you are going to do those things, you're going to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you're really doing those things, you're loving your neighbor as yourself. That's written on the heart. You don't, it doesn't just come into existence in Sinai. Uh, it's codified in Sinai. But then you have the positive law. And remember we talked about positive law? What's positive law? Positive law is the law that's given for specific people, time, and place. Okay, so... For instance, it, it comes, it's not something you can deduce by natural revelation. You can't look at the mountains and be like, yeah, I probably shouldn't eat that fruit. No, it was appealing to the eyes. In fact, it, it showed the opposite. The reason that it was shown to be wrong is because God said so. It came by direct revelation from, from, from God, and it was given for specific people, time, and place. Okay, so that rule to not eat of the fruit isn't binding for every single person who ever exists. It was unique for Adam in the garden. That was his probationary test. That was the positive law. It was for that specific people, time, and place. Um, and so, in so doing, it was tied into the moral law because God said so. So to break that would be to not love God, and to break that would break the moral law as well. So the Baptists are picking up on that and saying, uh, he willfully transgressed the law of creation as well as the positive law, the command given unto them in eating the forbidden fruit. Um, and God was pleased to give these things to him according to his wise and holy counsel to permit, having proposed to order it for his own glory. So that statement is there particularly because there are people who will say, well, then why would God create it? Why would he do those things? Why would he allow sin to enter the world? Why would he tempt them in this way? And it's, it's building to, you know, try to question God. It's trying to stand as judge over God. And, and they're saying, hey, remember who you're dealing with. God is most holy. He's most wise. He permits these things according to his will. He proposed it for really his own glory. He's not the author of it. He's not the author of sin. He's not, you know, no one tempts uh, God doesn't tempt anyone, but someone, people are in, tempted and enticed by his, their own desires, right? Um, and so God here is, though, giving that um, there for ultimately his glory. We know the grand scheme of things. Why did he allow that to happen? Well, 
He's going to send a greater Adam. He's going to show himself to be merciful. He's going to show himself to be the redeemer, the just and the justifier. And none of that can happen without a fall. And so God had ordained it before the foundations of the world. And it's seen there in that, uh, into the paragraph, by his most holy, wise counsel to permit. Proposed to order it for his own glory. And so ultimately for his glory. Everything he does is ultimately for his glory. Uh, in Genesis 3, Genesis 3, verse uh, 12, we see the result, right? We see it kind of play out here. Uh, God comes and says, you know, where are you? It's not because he's clueless. It's because he's giving them an opportunity to repent. He's showing that they're hiding and running away from God, just like Jonah did when he was in his sin. Right? And he asks the same question. Just like the captain asked Jonah, what have you done? That's what, Eve, that's what God tells Eve. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent. And then we see the curse ensue. So in Genesis 12 and 13, um, they're blame shifting. They're, they're shifting the blame. Right? Man is saying, oh, it's the woman. It's the woman. Ultimately, he's saying, it's the woman you gave me. Right? You're the one who gave me this. I, I was happy and content alone. But no, it wasn't good for man to be alone. And he's called to lead his family, to protect, to guard. And he didn't do that. And then God comes to the woman and says, what is this you have done? So there we see here, um, they willfully transgressed willfully transgressed the law of God. Um, they weren't, you know, forced. They weren't tricked. They weren't any of that. They were tempted to doubt God's word, right? Here's what God said. Oh, did he really say this? You know, he's trying to hold back some pleasure for you. And so they were tempted, and they willfully chose to believe Satan, the serpent, rather than believe God. And in so doing, broke the command of creation and the command of bitten fruit. And so paragraph one is trying to, to help us understand that. The substance of covenant works is all there, right? There's the righteous law. There's God who is holy. He's righteous. He commands man to be holy for he is holy. The law is there that promises life if you obey it, death if you disobey it. The substance is all there. So they hold to it here. Um, let's look at 2 Corinthians 11 real quick. Second Corinthians 11, verse 3, um, we see a little bit more about this. It says, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So here is the, the proof text for Satan using his subtlety of the serpent to seduce Eve, and then by seducing Adam who without any compulsion did willfully transgress the law. Notice again, the confession here brings out a little bit more about the responsibility of Adam here. Right? Talks about that. He, he is that federal head. But if you look at the next paragraph, um, they do follow along uh, with Westminster here from that first sentence where it talked about our first parents. And that's not to say there isn't, you know, well, why not emphasize Adam? It's just to say that was the common way to speak of, back then, Adam and Eve. They were our first parents. Every, all, everyone descends from them. It doesn't mean that Eve was just, you know, she was also a federal head. No, it was Adam was. It was just, that was the common way to talk about it back then in the confessions and in the language of, of uh, theology back then. That was just the common way. Um... Again, another thing that we see here, it talks about in the confession here, uh, the Holy Council to permit. So the fall that we see wasn't a surprise. God ordained it. He permitted it. And it all was for his own glory. It helps us see the previous state. And it's creating the need. As we, as we flush out this paragraph, man was holy. 
Man was perfect. Man was sinless. There came a law. Man willfully broke that law. Uh, God is holy and upholding these things and allowing this to all happen. But then in paragraph two, it brings out the idea of why and the consequences that this happened. What happens as a result of the fall? What happens as a result of Adam being our federal head and doing what he did? And this is just painting the picture, painting the need for why paragraph seven is so crucial in understanding uh, why we need grace. Um, Let's just read paragraph two. We're not going to get into it, but let's just read it. And uh, if there's questions on paragraph one, we can go from there. Um, But let's just read it, and then we can pray. It says, our first parents, by this sin, so it's carrying in the sin of breaking the law of transgression and the positive law of eating the forbidden fruit, by this sin fell from the original righteousness and communion with God, and we in them, whereby death came upon all, and all becoming dead in sin, wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. This is a paragraph really about total depravity. So we'll get, we'll get into that next time uh, as we continue. Um, but any questions, comments on paragraph one? Lisa? Yeah. So I wouldn't say negative law. I would say positive law and moral law. Those are the two categories to think through. Um, Yeah, it only comes by God's uh, special revelation given. Uh, It's something that is unique for that time period that that isn't binding for all people, time, and place. So positive law um, comes, you can't, you know, it's not written on the heart. It's something that God just says, you can't do this, or you must do this. Um, Therefore, it's right or wrong, because God said. Um, And it's there until he says, you know, otherwise. Um, for, or if he gives a different law for different people. So, for instance, you can think of some positive laws, circumcision, Old Covenant, baptism, Lord's Supper. Uh, these are all positive laws, right? Now, there's parallels and different things like that, but they're for a specific time, people, and place, right? So Adam and Eve, they, weren't, they didn't have the same uh, law back then uh, to... Uh, do the Lord's Supper, right? Because there was more revelation that had to happen to bring about the significance of what that meant. But for those who are post-cross, that's the command, right? To gather with the assembly on the Lord's Day, right? So we can say the moral law there, uh, the moral law is Sabbath, right? Honor the Sabbath. The day in which that happens was positive. So it, it changed based on uh, what God did and what God said. So they're closely related, but they're slightly different. And that helps us as we start, you know, understanding and we look at, you know, some of the, all these laws that we see in the Old Covenant. It helps us to understand, you know, why can we say uh, honor your father and mother? And then why can we say we don't have to have cotton and polyester? We don't have to, you know, refrain from doing that anymore. Why can we have, sh- you know, shellfish today, and uh, why couldn't they back then? Positive laws help us just better understand those categories and stuff like that. But there's also ceremonial law, which we also have in there, and some of that is, is related to positive law too. So just think positive law given by direct command. It's not inferred by nature. We can't just d- deduce it by reason, and it's for a specific people, time, and place, where the moral law is binding for everyone without exception. All, all people, time, and places. It's... Yeah. Um, I'll bring out the source. I believe that's actually a, um, a Presbyterian word that came out back then, um, and the Baptists just follow suit with holding to it. Um, but yeah, I can, I can bring up... Uh, I'll go back and look that up where it came from. But it's a helpful just clarification that comes out with better understanding law and categories there. So. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think all that. I think all that would you can be you can be safe to um, apply that there because God specifically commanded right that He's to basically um, guard and protect. He's supposed to speak to her, give her. He's the prophet, priest, and king. Uh, so he's called to do those things, to minister to his wife in that way and guard and protect. It's only after the fall that that, had, you know, that became corrupted and she then sought to you know, usurp that role. And ultimately that's what led to the fall is he allowed her to usurp it. Um, and so I would say it was also a failure of that. Is, yeah, uh, and that's what Paul brings out when he talks about uh, why women aren't to uh, preach and he brings out um, the fall and says, actually, it's not a matter of, you know, that they're just, you know, more prone to the fall. It's, it's a matter that they're, it's usurping God's given original, um, original way in which he ordained things. And so Paul brings that up uh, earlier, I believe, First Timothy. So. Good. Well, let's look at chapter... Two and three next time, we'll elaborate on those. And hopefully by then the PowerPoint will be up and running. Um, If you don't, if you want to get this on your own, I believe um, it's available um, digital. So the the book's out of print, but it's called True Confessions. And basically it's the doctrinal thesis of one of my professors, um, Dr. Renahan. And he basically just outlined First London, Savoy, Westminster, and second London, and just put it paragraph by paragraph and showed the differences. This is a very helpful, he, the helpful thing. He does it, he does it as well with um, catechism and um, uh, first London as well, looking at all those. So, um, Yeah, so if you want that, let me know. I can email you a link. I believe it's like 20 bucks. You can buy that and get the digital copy, but then you've got to be digital. So I believe you can print it, but it's like 100 pages. It might be costly. Anyways, let's pray, and we'll go ahead and uh, be ready for service. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you uh, for this time, and thank you that uh, even though we see the failure of our first parents and uh, how they transgress your law, that you are still holy and righteous, and you uphold your standard. You don't change it, that you were not surprised by it. You didn't bring about Christ because it was plan B, but that was your plan all along. Lord, you do that for your glory and for our good. And so, Lord, help us to, to make much of Christ and to look at his work as something that is magnificent, something that uh, is, is, is such a sacrifice on his part, but out of love he did for us. Lord, help us treasure that great gift of Christ and that he, not only did he obey the law, but he also took the curse of the law because of our failure. Lord, we thank you for Christ and we thank you for this time. We pray in his name. Amen.